Welcome to the annual C. Clyde Ferguson Lecture. We are just delighted to have all of you here, and I, I know you're as excited as I am to hear from our speaker, Mr. Vincent Warren, who you will be hearing from momentarily. Mr. Warren and I were having such a great conversation. We said, oh, we got to go downstairs and uh, let, give, uh, allow him to have an opportunity to talk to you. It turns out Mr. Warren and I are alums of the same law school. So you know we had to talk a little bit. Now the C. Clyde Ferguson Lecture uh, was established many years ago and uh, by Professor J. Clay Smith. And that's really Dean J. Clay Smith. Uh, a former Dean J. Clay Smith established this wonderful lecture. It's one of our oldest lectures at the law school. Uh, this lecture is not only sponsored by the Dean's Office, but also by the Human Rights and Globalization Law Review, one of our very fine student organizations that, in this case, publishes annually uh, at least one issue, sometimes at least one issue, of uh, very fine articles. So. Uh, I just have a couple more things, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Abanda, Amanda Butler-Jones. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Ferguson family. Uh, Ms. Eve Ferguson and Ms. Robin Ferguson, are you present? Why don't you just stand so that everybody can see you? Every year, um, when we ha host the Ferguson Lecture, members of the Ferguson family are always here. We thank you so much for your continuous support of this lecture, and we're honored to have you here. Thank you. Now, just an FYI, there will be a drawing at the end of the um, program uh, the C. Clyde Ferguson uh, drawing. Uh, some of you have been getting tickets. Is that right? How? I'm not sure. I guess I'll have to check with Ms. with Professor Thomas and make sure that I understand. So that was done in advance. Okay. So anyone who who answered the fact about Dean Ferguson is in the drawing. Okay, so that's how it works. Okay, I see that the other Ms. Ferguson stepped in the room. So uh, I, I, as you got comfortable, can I ask you to stand so that they can see you as well? Okay. <laughs> now get comfortable. All right, great to have you here. All right, um, we always uh, have a few minutes before the speaker begins to talk about Dean Ferguson. It's very important that you know why we have a C. Clyde Ferguson lecture. And Ms. Amanda Butler-Jones, who's the editor-in-chief of the Human Rights and Globalization Law Review, will come forward to tell you. Thank you, Dean Dark, and especially welcome to our, our special guests for this very important occasion. We're so happy to have you. Um, I want to thank Professor Thomas and, of course, Dean Crooms, the members of the Human Rights and Globalization Law Review. You all have put in a tremendous amount of effort for today, and I think this PAC auditorium is a testament to that. So I especially want to thank you for your hard work. You know, it's truly a privilege and a pleasure to stand here today before you all in tribute of C. Clyde Ferguson. Uh, he's a former dean of this institution, our school, Howard University School of Law, and he was such a scholar. He served at several institutions, not only here at Howard as our dean, but he was a former distinguished professor of law at Rutgers University School of Law, as Mr. Warren and Dean Dark are well familiar with, um, as well as serving as the Henry L. Stimson Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. But he wasn't only a scholar. In fact, his dedication to human rights is known as, as world-renowned, and there are many quotes about him, but one that I think speaks truly to the essence of who he is as a social engineer was that he labored tirelessly 
to safeguard and extend the fundamental freedoms. That's something that I know we try to do and promote through the Human Rights and Globalization Law Review, and I know each one of us as students of this law school and stewards of that mission also intend to do. His dedication to human rights can be seen through acting as general counsel to the United States Commission on Civil Rights, special legal advisor to Governor Adlai Stevenson, a permanent resident to the UN, and a United States ambassador to Uganda. Dean Ferguson was a graduate of Ohio State University. He went on to study at Harvard Law School and authored five books. And today, we honor Dean Ferguson, his legacy, and all that he did throughout his distinguished career. And we thank his family members who are here in attendance. We thank all of you who are also here to pay tribute to him. So please join me as we acknowledge that legacy and thank him for all that he's done. Excellent, very well put. And now the introduction of our keynote speaker, by Dean Crooms Robinson. Afternoon. Afternoon. Welcome. We're glad to see, we see y'all once a year, but we're always very happy to see you. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of doing it briefly, introducing our guest speaker today. Um, I will just recommend to you the written bio in this lovely program that's been printed up. Um, that's a hint, I'm not gonna read. Um, and I know I stand in between you hearing him and hearing what he wants to share with us. The only thing I wanted to note was um, Mr. Warren, Vincent, Vince, um, comes standing on the shoulders of many people, and I realize given the age demographic here, many of you all may not even know who some of these people are. The likes of Bill Kunstler, uh, Peter Weiss, uh, many of the folks who came together to form the Center for Constitutional Rights to think in 2013 that you are getting ready to hear from the current leader of that organization in light of that history is incredibly moving. Add to that the fact that he's here to commemorate C. Clyde Ferguson, who among all of his accolades was the UN expert to the uh, UN Subcommittee on Race Discrimination, which drafted, and as I hear it, the anecdotes are that your dad did the vast majority of the work on this, um, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, in other words, the Race Convention. To have Mr. Warren as our speaker to commemorate the very good work that was done by uh, Dean Ferguson and continues in his spirit um, is a fabulous thing because it, it does demonstrate that we've reached a point where it is more often than not we're talking about things at the intersection of what used to be domestic civil rights and human rights. And in some ways it would seem to me that that would be wholly consistent with where it was that Dean Ferguson thought that we actually ought to go. That when we talk about human rights, it's not looking out there, but it's examining what's going on in our own country and determining how out of this institutional base, we can move this continuing struggle forward. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you yet another soldier in that struggle, Vincent Warren. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello. All right. Um, it is such an honor to be here. Um, it's, it's very hard for me to put in words. Thank you very much, Dean Dark, for your wonderful introduction. And thank you very much, uh, Dean Crooms, Crooms Robinson, uh, for your remarks as well. I'd like to thank very much the Human Rights uh, Globalization uh, Law Review for sponsoring this discussion. Um, I want to thank the Ferguson family for uh, the legacy that you've left us. And I also want to thank um, my friend and colleague, Professor Morris Davis, who um, has been an inspiration to me as a, uh, a lawyer and a person at CCR that has worked on Guantanamo and has a lot to teach the world about the courage that lawyers can bring to their work when they partner their expertise with justice. Um, last year, thousands of people marched to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the extraordinary mobilization of black folks in Selma, Alabama. 
folks who took to the streets to demand justice, to demand the changes in the way that they were treated. They marched not to remember a history lesson, but to clear a path for the future, a path down which many of you will walk and down which some of you will lead. We have seen something close to revolutionary change over the last 50 years in this country. We have cell phones, we have the internet, and we have instant access to news everywhere. The terms to describe of us have shifted from Negro to Black to African American. More of us are in college and in law school at this point than in any other in our history. And of course, significantly, this country has elected its first African American president. However, despite these changes, many aspects of life for people of color remain shackled to our Jim Crow past. The police still shoot us without repercussion. More of us are jailed at any point, at this point than at any other point in our history. And policymakers and school efficient officials find it so much easier to kick our children out of school than to provide them a quality education. A more cynical way, perhaps, to think about the progress Africans Americans, African Americans have made in this country with respect to the criminal justice context is to say that perhaps the biggest change for us is now that we are regarded as African American criminals and no longer Negro criminals. One need only look to the recent events in Florida around the, Trayvon, the shooting of Trayvon Martin. Um, many of you have been very involved and active, Dean Dark was telling me. But you just need to look at that to know that our past remains our present as far as the criminal justice system treats us. Unfortunately, Trayvon is one in a long line of African American people who have been shot down for nothing more than being black in America while the debate and commentary around the circumstances of that killing center more on him, on what he was wearing, on what he was carrying, on what he was eating, and what was he doing in that neighborhood than on the person who actually shot him. Taking a moment to look closely at the facts and circumstances of this shooting, one only has to look, one has to look very hard to discover a narrative that even approaches what justice should look like in circumstances where an African-American man is killed. That narrative has been and continues to be missing from the discussion about these types of situations. That justice narrative gets hijacked. It gets hijacked by rank hypothesizing about what the law allows and what the law does not. That narrative gets <clears throat> hijacked by bald assertions of how danger it is for, dangerous it is for law enforcement to police black people in black communities. That narrative gets hijacked by the obsessive focus on the proclivities of the shooter and the social vulnerabilities of the victim. So we find ourselves deeply frustrated and perhaps ill-equipped as a society to articulate just what exactly the law has to do with justice when the victim of a crime is African American. What the law has to do with justice can be a particularly vexing question. First, the question assumes that the law is a construction that is not subject to broad interpretation. And second, it assumes that justice is a commonly understood and broadly agreed upon concept. Surely we know that neither of those assumptions are true. Which raises a slightly different question for us then. If it's up to a judge to, deter to determine what the law is, and if justice is essentially in the eye of the beholder, why is it that we believe, why do we believe that justice in the law can ever be connected under any circumstances other than coincidence or just dumb luck? The answer, I believe, lies in the very foundation of social justice lawyering. Lawyering that my organization, the Center for Constitutional Rights, has practiced for four decades. The social justice lawyer advocates for social change. To take concrete steps to achieve social change through the law, the social justice must, social justice lawyer must, very much like a mathematician, solve for the variables on both sides of the equation, particularly on issues where race and criminal law and detention intersect. You must convince the judges that the law requires a better outcome for the human being housed in the institution rather than for the institution that houses the human being. And you also must convince the general public that justice is possible. Tomorrow, to coincide with World Day Against the Death Penalty, 
CCR, my organization, will be releasing a report on our findings from an international mission which explored through an international human rights lens uh, how the death penalty in this country is implemented in two states, California and Louisiana. The purpose of the mission in some respects can be summarized by our attempts to articulate both sides of the justice and law question and solve for the variables. We use human rights framework in part because it is broader in scope with respect to the affirmative obligations that this, of the state to the individual than the US Constitution, and in part because by and large, judges in the United States need to be convinced that international law can and should be applied to the deep and intractable issues of our time where there seem to be a profound set of questions about the relationship between law on the one hand and justice on the other. And the death penalty is one of those issues. In traveling in the mission, together with colleagues from the International Federation for Human Rights and uh, Florence, Florence Bellivier, who is the president of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty, we found that California has the largest number of people on death row in the country. And Louisiana, of course, is infamous for harsh conditions of its prisoners on death row. The mission reached two overarching conclusions. Number one, the public officials in California and Louisiana do not, as a matter of course, apply an international human rights framework to their analysis and discussion of the death penalty. And two, analyzing the application of the death penalty through a human rights framework reveals that both states, both states are in breach of inter internationally recognized standards. So while the United States has played a very pivotal role in drafting some of the key human rights documents, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and continues to hold itself out as the global leader on human rights, the, the US global viewpoint belies the reality of American exceptionalism, whereby the United States chooses which internationally accepted standards or obligations it will and will not follow. And this ambivalence to the international human rights framework is stark and disturbing, particularly in the context of the death penalty. Internationally, there is a clear recognition that the death, the death penalty implicates not only criminal law, but also human rights law. Although the death penalty is not widely regarded in international conventions as a per se violation of hum international human rights, its practice, its practice must strictly comply with all of the protections otherwise afforded by human rights law, including the right to a fair trial with due, full due process protections in place. Moreover, the conditions under which death row inmates are housed must comply with international standards, including standards, the standard minimum rules on the treatment of prisoners. So coincident with the United Nations Human Rights Committee's review of the United States obligation under the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, this mission did not seek to simply criticize and condemn uh, the United States system, but rather to highlight a path of application for international human rights at the state level. Because human rights are protected by the ICCPR, which the US has signed and ratified, uh, they must, the US must guarantee the, the state party in general, but also its subdivisions, the federal, the state, the local, the executive, the administrative, and the judicial, uh, need to support those rights. And we call on these governments in this report to take immediate action under their obligations. International trends also show um, a tremendous progress towards abolition. Over two-thirds of the world nations are now abolition in law or practice, with an average of three countries per year abolishing capital punishment since 1990. The use of the death penalty has also been increasingly curtailed through international law. In the early stages after World War II, international law instruments either made no mention of capital punishment or allowed it to happen under, uh, as a carefully worded exception to the right to life. International law limited the punishment, excluding certain protected categories of individuals from execution, including juveniles, pregnant women, and the elderly, and confining its use to an ever-shrinking list of serious crimes. But as the consensus has grown, international law has become increasingly abolitionist. For example, the American Convention on Human Rights, adopted in 1969, prevents the reinstatement of the death penalty once abolished. 
Since 1980, four human rights treaties had been adopted that proclaimed the abolition of capital punishment. In 2007, the UN General Assembly approved Resolution 62-149, which calls for all retention estates to abolish, excuse me, to establish a moratorium on executions with a view to abolishing the death penalty. Two further resolutions reaffirm the call for a global moratorium were adopted in 2008 and 2010, and so on. But the international conversation and movement towards abolition stands in stark contrast to what's happening on the ground right here in the United States. So in that respect, our findings didn't surprise us. The death penalty is inhumane. The death penalty is fallible. It is expensive. The death penalty is an ineffective crime deterrent. And it is also no secret that the death penalty in the United States is carried out in an incredibly discriminatory manner, racially discriminatory manner. African Americans and Latino make up, Latinos make up more than half of the people on death row, while comprising about a quarter of the US population. Looking at the race of the victim, in the last 30 years, only 20 white on black murders have resulted in execution, compared to 261 black on white. You probably can't recall the last time the state of Louisiana executed a white person for a crime against an African American person. And that's because the last time that happened was in 1752. What remains largely unseen, however, is that beneath this veneer of due process, thousands, thousands of death row inmates are now often subjected to conditions that constitute torture, sometimes for decades on end while waiting to be executed or exonerated. These conditions, as much as the death penalty itself, constitute violations of established international human rights law, as well as the constitutional right against cruel and inhuman and unusual punishment. California has 727 individuals currently on death row, including 19 women. An average of 20 new judgments, 20 of judgments of death per year are put in place. California is, leading the, is the leading death penalty state in the United States. Its death row is by far the most populous in the country and contains nearly twice as many contemned men and women as the nation's second largest death row in Florida, which houses 404. Now, California adopted its death penalty law by popular initiative in 1978, two, two years after the Supreme Court uh, reaffirmed the country's acceptance of the death penalty in Gregg versus Georgia. And since then, the death row population has increased steadily. But unlike other states where large death row populations uh, exist, California has actually carried out relatively few ex executions. 13 individuals have been executed since 1978, and none have been executed since a court-ordered court stay was entered in 2006. More people in California have died from suicides than from execution. And three times as many have died from natural causes than from execution. So although the lack of executions in California might lead some to believe that the state has little appetite for the death penalty, a recent election suggests that its citizens remain reluctant to give up the symbolism and the fiction of meeting out the ultimate punishment to the worst of the worst. Last fall, abolitionist organizations around the state mounted a $7 million campaign to support Proposition 34, which was a statewide ballot to abolish the death penalty um, and convert the sentences of 700 people into life without parole. Now, the measure failed by a slim majority, and as a result, the population continues to grow, even as the state struggles to meet minimum international standards for conditions of confinement for the current condemned population. Nonetheless, the campaign highlighted many of the problems that actually plague the death penalty. Um, that habeas corpus is being stripped. The prisoners um, that are serving life sentences have no counsel whatsoever. And also illuminated is the painful trade-off that many on death row face after a state abolishes capital punishment, the loss of many meaningful opportunities to pursue claims of innocence. In terms of discrimination, the mission found that the implementation of the death penalty in California is deeply, deeply problematic. What remains to be seen, however, is how, those, how, the, how the discrimination is going to be challenged and dealt with in the context 
of criminal cases, which is very, very hard to do. In Louisiana, uh, the mission found that the death penalty is racially discriminatory as well. Although the US standards require proof of discriminatory purpose to find a case of unlawful discrimination, uh, CERD uh, considers both discriminatory purpose and effect, which is readily seen in Louisiana. Of the people on death row, 58 are black, 26 are white, three are Latino, and one is Asian. African Americans are so overrepresented in death row, they make up 65% of those sentenced to death in a state where the black population is 32%. And the inequality is most frequently attributed to the exercise of prosecutorial discretion, which, evidence, which the evidence suggests is consciously or subconsciously influenced by racial factors. As a result of these practices, there is significant arbitrary and dis arbitrariness and discrimination in the imp imposition of the death penalty when looking at the state as a whole. The mission also concluded that the conditions on death row in Louisiana constitute torture uh, in some circumstances, violating the Convention Against Torture and international law on the treatment of pre prisoners. Those sentenced to, sentenced to death with the exception of two women on death row in an all-male facility live in the Louisiana State Penitentiary, a former plantation turned hard labor prison most commonly referred to as Angola. Do you know why it's called Angola? It's called Angola because it was named after the home country of the slaves that worked on that original plantation, and they keep that name to this day for this, for this institution that, hi hire, that excuse me, houses a tremendous number of black people, and it is absolutely infamous for its history of, of brutality and racism. Now the conditions on, at, at Angola are marked by a lengthy period of time that some inmates spend in them due to court delays and the state's inability to provide defense counsel in a timely fashion. The majority of prisoners have spent at least a decade on death row, and the longest period the current prisoner has spent on death row is 28 years. Inmates are housed in single cells where they are alone with limited communications with others for 23 hours out of a 24-hour day. During this time, they're not allowed to attend class, they're not allowed to participate in rehabilitative or creative outlets, and they are housed in a building which does not use air conditioning, even though the infrastructure for air conditioning exists. As a result, the temperature in the summer regularly reaches over 100 degrees, and due to the humidity, the index is much higher. This oppressive heat is exacerbated by a lack of ventilation and cool water to drink and bathe in. Now, the state of Louisiana does not provide cooled water and clean ice for people to drink. But the state of Louisiana does, however, offer death row tours to the public so they can watch people bake in that sun. The isolation coupled with this difficult prison conditions and the mental torment of a pending execution causes severe mental suffering and the deterioration of most prisoners' mental states. Attorneys working with inmates on death row in Louisiana indicated that a large portion of their work consists in supporting their clients' mental stability and that several clients have considered volunteering early for execution. Those who have not been appointed attorney face even more daunting mental health issues as a result of their isolation. Despite the needs of the prisoner, the clinic at Angola has no mental health wing, no hospital, and no therapeutic services, only pharmacological treatment for prisoners. Even those with the most severe illnesses are unable to receive treatment in a mental hospital, and it is reported that prison officials have placed at least one, mental in, one inmate with mental illness in an even more restrictive setting. Further, an inmate found to be incompetent to execute due to mental illness still remains on death row without receiving specialized care ne nearly 20 years after the Louisiana Supreme Court found that he could not be forcibly medicated. Let's think about that. He is too mentally ill to execute. The Supreme Court says he cannot be medicated, so Louisiana's solution is we'll just leave him in isolation on death row. The mission demonstrated that the world is leaving the US behind when it comes to applying law and justice in the context of the death penalty. The reluctance of the courts and governmental officials to embrace and apply applicable law 
to achieve a just and human result for people within the criminal justice system remains a key obstacle to realizing the promise of the US human rights vision and the full participation and freedom of communities of color in this country. So we're back to that question, how do we marry law and justice? Well, that's where you come in. Although the criminalization of African Americans has not changed much in the last few years, we are fortunate that another thing has also not changed, and that is people who suffer injustice still fight. Organizers still work in the community to amplify the voices of the affected, and dedicated leaders are still needed to take these fights into the courts. The opportunities are all around us. Brilliant and brave fights have emerged all around the country, including um, in, in Florida with the Dream Defenders. The, 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 the number of these types of fights that have emerged are countless. I'm also proud to say that my organization has been involved in a very key uh, challenge in New York around stop and frisk. You may have heard about this case. We recently won a, uh, a landmark judgment after a nine week trial challenging a stop and frisk program in which over 500, excuse me, over five million people have been stopped by the New York City Police Department. Of those five million people, 87% were African American and Latino. Of the 87% that were stopped that were African American and Latino, only 12% were referred to a court in one way or another or arrested. And of the justification for the stop and frisk program, which is that it gets guns and drugs off the street, only 0.12% of those five million stops resulted in a gun seizure. The fight in that context is how do people in communities fight back against police repression when the entire justice narrative is that black communities need to be policed for the protection of our society? The question is, what tools do we use to articulate the truth of our experiences with the police, to articulate the truth of our need for the police in some circumstances without having the police policing entire communities? The average lawyer might look at this information and feel despair. They might feel hopeless. They might feel helpless to do anything about it. However, the social justice lawyer looks not just at what is there, but looks for ways to move the facts in the law towards a justice narrative, a narrative in which African American people are not considered criminals, not considered defendants, not considered inmates, parolees, probationers, unemployed, underprivileged, undereducated, troubled, drug addicted, lazy, or unintelligent, but rather as human beings, as the human beings that we are, many of whom survive and thrive ingeniously under subhuman urban conditions. Once that narrative is articulated, it becomes clearer to society that being shot in cold blood like Trayvon, being stopped in frisk without any legal justification, or being held in appalling and inhumane conditions on death row can never be considered a result of personal failure, a result of poor upbringing, or a result of the potential of the person or the community for criminal behavior. And it shifts the focus from the individual to the system that must respond in a manner that values the human life caught within it. It is the systems of injustice in particular that the social justice lawyer looks to dismantle. It is not an easy fight. People are often compelled to make gradual changes within it, but the system never has and never will change itself. The system can't even articulate how it oppresses, much more take steps to change it from op oppression to justice. And there's a quote from Frederick Douglass that you might be familiar with, is that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. And that is what we are here to do, using our skills as civilians, as lawyers, as people in the community to demand justice to, so power concedes, concedes how it oppresses our communities. And luckily you can do all of these things particularly the lawyers in the room, the future lawyers, as lawyers you have tremendous responsibility and power to articulate how the systems of racial justice affect people of color and all people. 
And you must give yourself the authority. You must give yourself the authority to take the st difficult steps to change the system from oppressed to justice. And deeply and most fundamentally, everybody in this room has got to believe, you have got to believe that justice is possible. Thank you. just have this to say wow <laughs> wow excellent thank you very much mr. Warren now we have built into this uh, lecture time for you to ask some questions an opportunity to speak directly to our um, Clyde Ferguson lecturer so this is the way we're going to operate you see these microphones uh, you could just line up in front of the microphone and um, you'll be called on alternating one after another. Now, here is your instruction. We are asking questions. We are not giving speeches. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you try to give a speech, I'll just let, I'll let Mr. Warren hit it first, and then, you know, I may come forward. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so for, if you have questions, please line up. And while uh, folks are uh, getting themselves to the microphones, I'll just remind you that uh, there, are, there will be a drawing uh, at the end of the program. Just a second. Okay. I'll start over here. Would you mind just telling me your name as well? I met you before. Right? Yes. Mr. Warren, um, my name is Nicole Triplett. I'm a third year law school student from Memphis, Tennessee. Again, thank you for coming to speak to us. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, you mentioned Angola, and I, I just wanted to get your thoughts specifically about the Angola Three since they're in the news. Uh, Herman Wallace, unfortunately, was released last week and unfortunately died um, after getting his, his conviction overturned after spending 42 years in solitary confinement. Now with Albert Woodfox, the only one uh, out of the Angola Three left in confinement, so he's spending another 40, excuse me, 41 years in solitary confinement. What are your thoughts on getting justice for Woodfox and um, I guess bringing in some of the human rights implications that are obviously at stake here? And then I have a second part of the question. Um, you mentioned the difficulty with people, uh, especially people who are serving death row, with the high risk of court error when it comes to their convictions, it seems to be harder for death row inmates to be able to obtain habeas relief, habeas corpus relief. So with the Anti-Terrorism um, and Effective Death Penalty Act, what are your thoughts on getting that change in the way that the courts are now interpreting? Those are two <coughs> excellent questions, Nicole. Mm -hmm. Um, with respect to the Angola Three, and thank you for raising that, um, th I was uh, on the phone with some of uh, the advocates in Louisiana who were feeling a mixture of joy and sadness. The joy was that Herman finally came home after being in incarcerated under such cruel conditions for so long, but sadness because um, he wasn't home for long. He died, uh, he was brought home because he was severely ill, and he died very shortly after getting home. But I will say that the justice community rallied around him. Um, he has, the Angola Three work, particularly in Louisiana, has been very, very strong. And in fact, when I was asking folks how they were going to handle this, they said, well, the next move is that we now need to get Wood Fox out. Mm -hmm. And so the, the entire campaign that's shifting natu nationally is now shifting towards uh, work with, 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 with Mr. Woodfox. <clears throat> it is a challenging situation. I'll just sort of point out that my organization has a lawsuit, not in Louisiana, but in California, challenging solitary confinement um, on a constitutional basis um, in Pelican Bay Prison in California. And it is a very long and uh, arduous process. And I fear, thank you very much, that 
Um, after having been there for, 40, for 41 years, Mr. Woodfox uh, really can't wait around for a judge to decide to do the right thing. So I think the, the next piece of this is going to be stepping up the public pressure. I would, I would urge all of you that don't know anything about this to immediately uh, go on the website and join the Angola 3 work. It's ex incredible work and they actually need you. With respect to the habeas corpus piece, um, habeas has always been a very uneasy compromise, and um, the Anti-Effective uh, Death Penalty Act of uh, 1996, I think, what took out um, a lot of the, uh, the teeth for meaningful review. And the problem that I think that the, that the inmates face around the country is that there's no right to counsel for um, these habeas, these habeas mm -hmm. corpus reviews. And so any of you who will be clerking for federal judges will um, be getting these types of petitions on handwritten paper, on toilet paper, and handwriting, um, that there is really, is, it is essentially form without substance. It's a lot of paperwork that a lot of folks do not take seriously. And I just want to just make one point that I think is, was interesting from our exploration, is that you have two sides. You have additional due process, and then you have uh, the torturous conditions, right? You have two, two sides of, this, of the human rights problem. The more process is generally a good thing, and for the non-lawyers that means more abilities to challenge the evidence that got you to the position where you were. That's usually a good thing. Uh, but the problem is, is that the more process that you give, the more delays that the system builds in, the longer you remain in inhuman, inhumane conditions. So it's this interesting paradox that sort of leads me to believe that more process doesn't get you out of the human rights problem, it only gets you out of the constitutional problem, which is why uh, we've been looking at it through the human rights lens. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mr. Warren, thank you so much for coming out. My name is Dorsey Harrison, I'm a 2L. And my question was about the uh, death penalty discussion. A lot of the states that we've discussed today, Louisiana, California, and a few others, are some of the highest states in regards to executions, yet they're also some of the most restrictive states as far as abortion is concerned. So I was wondering if your organization uh, handles that issue uh, in that way, speaking with that argument of if you're trying to, um, if you're killing people and also trying to uh, promote life, how can you reconcile that and how you all handle such an argument? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you, Dorsey. And everybody, please call me Vince. As if you call me Mr. Warm, I have to call my father up. Um, <laughs> um, we, the, the question is um, looking at the, li the, the way that the right to life has been articulated. So on one hand, the state says that it's the right to execute people. On the other hand, um, the state says that it has the right to limit the uh, right of the woman uh, to be able to uh, terminate a pregnancy and what are the equivalencies there. So Dorsey, we actually don't create, a, a, where'd you go, there you go. We don't, we don't create a CCR equivalencies between those two pieces. I largely think um, that this right to life context in the way that it's being raised is largely a set of very well vetted right wing talking points. Um, they don't add up and they don't really make sense because at some level, um, the state is, they're doing two different, the state would be talking out of both sides of its mouth. In the abortion context, the state is telling the individual that they don't have the right to their own bodily integrity um, and therefore is, are ordering them to desist from um, quote unquote taking a life. And on the other hand, um, the state is saying we actually do have the power as the state to take the life. And so you end up with a situation where if that we go down that road, we've ceded to the government that we as individuals don't have the right to determine our own bodily integrity, including the lives that are within us, but we give that power to the state when they choose to do it for us. So we don't, we don't use work with that kind of equivalency for that reason. Hi, how you doing? Hello, Vince. Uh, my name is Ulysses Williams. I'm a 1L. Uh, listen to your speech. You referenced uh, concern with the <clears throat> with the individual more so than a concern for the institution that houses the individual. And I was wondering if that was a reference to the prison industrial super complex. Yes, it is. Um, it's uh, it, but it's but it goes beyond that. I'm talking about that in the in the context of uh, the death penalty and criminal justice. But when you think about interactions, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm framing this in terms of a racial discussion, but if you think about interactions with broadly with people of color, with poor people, um, and the government, and I don't want to sound like a Tea Party activist, but um, when you look at the, in, the, the connections that people have with government, whether it's in terms of welfare, whether it's in terms of housing, whether it's in terms of all manner of things that people need to survive, um, the entanglements uh, with the government 
make it so that the government begins to control how people live their lives. And so anybody that's been in a situation uh, where, for example, in the, in the child welfare system, where the government quite literally takes control of your child and your parenting decisions, and that any type of, you can't litigate against it, it's very hard to litigate against it as a lawyer, and you can only really deal with it on the individual basis. And when you look at the process that you're due, in, um, in those types of situations, they always go for the government. The individuals are left with very little real protections to challenge wrong actions. It costs them time, it costs them money, and the courts are always looking to keep from charging the government for time and money. So I'm really thinking about it more broadly. What would it look like if our justice system allowed us to ask the question through the law, is this system working well for people? as opposed to the way that it really is, are the people playing by the rules within the system? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, Vince. Um, my name is Alana Sisnet. I am a 3L. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, when I was listening to you speak, you mentioned um, the differences between minorities who were affected by stop and frisk. Um, do you have any um, response to how men and women react differently to stop and frisk. I, can you, I don't know how men and women react differently. To the issue of stop and frisk? Or? Yes, the issue of stop and frisk and how um, it's usually perceived that it's African American males who get stopped. What about women? What oh, about? That's, that's a great question. I could definitely talk about that. Um, it is, uh, when we talk about African American men in stop and frisk, it is largely a shorthand for the range of communities that have to deal with stop and frisk with a range of, of types of people. So African Americans and Latinos are the number, males are the number one um, target of this practice and, it's the, and the, these are the groups that people mostly recognize. But there are other groups as well that experience this in very different ways. Um, two of the groups, three, three of the groups would be um, um, uh, undocumented people, another group would be women, another group would be LGBT folks. With respect to LGBT folks, um, the police very often, and we, we actually have a, a report this, of this on the CCR website if you have a chance to take a look at it, um, that very often the police will use gender stereotypes in the context of a frisk. So they will see a, um, uh, someone that they think is a man but who identifies as a woman, and they will harass that person in, during the context of the stops or sometimes even stop them just because it doesn't add up to them, it doesn't add up for them. Um, this happens all the time. Very often, um, young men are uh, criminalized and assumed to be soliciting for sex and stopped on that basis, even though there's no reason for it. And it's very similar with women. The, the stops that we've seen and that we've told when we talk to women about who've been stopped, these stops are largely very sexualized. Uh, the police officers will always, uh, will very often look to sexualize the stop in, in exchange for sex. Um, offering or, or, or cajoling or trying to get the woman to, to sexualize the, the, the conversation in order to get out of it. Um, you know, the, the, the truism is for African American men, the only thing you can do is to get out of the situation is to keep your mouth shut. And I think for women, I think the way that they're doing it is that the only thing that you can do is to engage with the police officer um, and try to, to sexualize your way out of a stop. So we've been hearing a lot of that. The numbers aren't as, as stark. Um, and we're both mostly going with the data that the police department have, has, have given us. But I think the next piece in the policing model is to really surface gender um, in, in these types of discussions and to have more information and more, more talking about that. So I'm really glad that you, that you brought it up, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Vince. Thank you for being here. My name is Louie McDonald. I'm a 3L. I have a question for you. Um, how do you suggest we forge political international allies in the fight to challenge uh, death penalty poli policies in the U.S., specifically the ones that you just spoke about. How do we challenge international allies? Yes. How do you suggest we forge political international allies in the fight to challenge uh, death penalty policies in the U.S., specifically um, to the ones that you spoke about? Uh, that's a great question. Now, Louie is pretending like he never met me before, but Louie Louis, Louis was, was my savior in terms of, I got here late today and he got me where I needed to go, so thank you, brother, for that. Not a problem. Um, <laughs> but 
Um, in terms of, of, the inter of forging the international alliances, there's a very interesting project that's, uh, that's going on that Professor Crooms has been very deeply, excuse me, Dean Crooms has been very deeply involved in. And it's the idea of looking at the, as she mentioned, the domestic from the human rights lens. And so what's happening here, how can we bring in the international norms that are happening, and also how can we export the information about what's happening here to the international community. So this report, in some level, tries to speak to both of those things. It gives information to the, to the folks on the ground, but it also explains to the international community what's, what's going on here. And so the process that's happening now is, um, uh, the review for the ICCPR, and there are range hundreds of US-based NGOs that will be going to Geneva in two days um, to attend these hearings and to give testimony and shadow reports on the human rights crisis that's happening in our communities all of the time. There's a very vibrant network that is growing here through the, a group called the US Human Rights Network, um, which is another wonderful organization that you should check out, um, among others. Um, and the idea there is to connect first the U.S. advocates and bring in folks that are used to working on this level with these types of protocols and to then essentially have a discussion with the United States in the context of the U.N. And that's what's happening. I'll just sort of, as a, as a sort of side note, people have been talking about all of the problems with the, uh, with the government shutdown. Another big problem with the government shutdown is um, I think the U.S. is sort of making some noises like, oh, well, we have a shutdown, so maybe we're not going to go to Geneva. Um, they may not be showing up. Wouldn't be the first time that they didn't show up for um, when these advocates are there. But uh, you know, that's 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 one of the main things that I think is really hot, and it's a really great idea that people are doing there. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello. My name is James Underwood. I'm a one L student, Hi, James. and uh, I'm a native New Yorker. First and foremost, I want to thank you for champion championing the fight against stop and frisk. I've been stopping and frisk on numerous occasions, and it's not a good feeling. Um, I understand that Mayor Bloomberg is going to attempt to appeal the decision, and I just wanted to know how do you feel the results will be upon his, his attempt to appeal? Oh, that's great. Thank you, James, for that, and uh, New York represent. Um, <laughs> I, you, you know I had to do it, right? You know I had to do it. Um, the, Mayor Bloomberg, the, the, here's the good news. The good news is that we only have to call him Mayor Bloomberg for another month or so, right? Yes. There's going to be an election, he's out. Um, but in fact, we won that decision on a Monday, and they appealed it by Friday. And so it's in this really interesting uh, procedural posture where the uh, city appealed the decision to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Then the city went back to the trial court judge and asked her <clears throat> to stay her remedial order. It's a very broad remedial order that actually brings in uh, communities. The first time after a trial where a judge has, judge has ordered a community engagement in the reform process that really talks about the most vulnerable in our society and the most affected. Um, so then Mayor Bloomberg in the city then said, filed a, a petition to stay the ruling, um, excuse me, the, the remedial action until the appeal happens. So you have two things that are happening. Um, the judge denied the stay, and then they are now applying to the Second Circuit for the stay. So it's a big, hot mess. But here's what's really kind of interesting, is that a lot of the city council members, this, this, the city uh, uh, legislature, have filed amicus briefs in support of our position. Uh, we are starting to have a drop the appeal campaign, which is sort of aimed towards um, uh, Mr. de Blasio, who is likely to be the next mayor. Um, and so politically, I think what's going to happen is the following. We get a new mayor, which is good. The new mayor then gives us a new police commissioner, which is good. The question is, who's that new police commissioner going to be? Um, you, this whole thing can go south very quickly if you have the wrong police commissioner there. And the police commissioner question is um, um, determined as much by politics as by policing chops. And so it's now a very political hot question. And so we're focusing very much on trying to um, make sure that, number one, the politicians that supported this thing uh, back in, uh, in August they get very squirrely when it gets to November. When it gets election time, they say all kinds of different stuff. So we want to keep them focused on it. Um, and then we also want to make sure that the groups on the ground and allies are out there putting pressure on de Blasio to pick a police commissioner that is actually going to lead the change of this next piece. OK, thank you. All right, thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Dariah Rosen. I'm a third year student. Hi, um, I have a two-part question. Um, first. 
um, you kind of spoke about prosecutorial uh, discretion. And the question is, um, how do you combat the criminal justice system, um, especially in today where we employ more African American judges in prosecutors? How do you uh, fight or combat that racial imbalance when we have people who look like us or the African Americans who are supposed to help us actually in the system and are the ones who are imposing these sentences? And then second, a follow-up is um, you ended with, you um, have to believe that justice is possible. And um, I know that I have and many of my colleagues have uh, committed to the fight for justice and for social change, but how do you, or I guess what would be advice to stay motivated on a daily basis knowing that it's a uphill battle, I guess. Those are, those are, those are great questions. Um, the first question, um, which I've sort of heard is having, uh, when you have more, now that we have more and more people co of color that are in the criminal justice system as prosecutors and judges, how do we deal with the question of, dis does discretion question change um, now that you have black folks in those positions? That's how I'm interpreting the question. Is that what it's sort of? Right, or how do we approach do we combating approach well, I guess because it's like, oh, well, it's a racial imbalance, but now that we have more African Americans in these positions, you you would think that it would change, but how does that, right. I guess, shift the fight? That's, okay, thank you. So the, the, I think I would say that the biggest mistake that most people make is to think, is to, um, is to focus on the person as opposed to the power of their position, because the power of the position of a prosecutor, of a judge, of a senator, of a president, um, can be so corrupting to the individual that very often the things that the individual says before they had that power and what they believed before they had that power goes away and they start acting um, to essentially keep the power structure going. So, um, you know, I've been a very vocal critic of President Obama on his Guantanamo policies, as many of you know. And one of the things that I say in, in that context is, is that the real, the the problem isn't just President Obama, the problem is the amount of power that we've given the presidency. And I think it's the same concept with respect to uh, prosecutors and, and judges. Because at the end of the day, um, it's up, the community needs to be able to recognize that arbitrary decisions, whether they are racially discriminatory or whether they're just, I don't like the way this person looks or whether they're gender based or whether they're LGBT biased, that those types of that limiting the discretion to, of courts to be able to consider those factors in criminal cases is really the goal. But even if we were to do that, even if we were to say there's no discretion whatsoever, right, and we've had some of those experiments like um, with um, some of those uh, mandatory minimum laws, then we find that it doesn't really solve the problem because it's not just an output problem, there's an input problem, which is goes to stop and frisk, is that you can have a system where the judges and the courts have no discretion, but you can still have bad outcomes if the system is arresting a lot of low-level black and Latino drug, dealer, uh, excuse me, drug users that should not be in jail. And so what, no matter what the system does other than kicking them out, um, you still have this problem, this input problem. So I think that where we need to be focused is um, on the front end as well. Why is it, what are the decisions that, ma that are made that get people into the system to begin with? We actually have more control over that than most people would think. One example would be stop and frisk. We can theoretically reduce the number of people uh, on a racially discriminatory basis through stop, stop and script if the police department changes its uh, behavior as an example. Um, so I would say, Focus less on trying to change the uh, trying to change the face of the judiciary, and focus more on questioning the power that we're giving the judiciary over the people that go through them. Um, in terms of justice is possible and staying motivated, it is it is one of the hardest things to do. And y'all are just too young to be beat down over this stuff. I'm sorry, because that just makes my back hurt. I'm like, why am I going to get out of bed in the morning if you guys are like, well, I don't know what we can do. But here's the thing. That, but the, the, the question is, um, thank you, is this. You can't, n history is replete with people who have said, you just can't get there from there. I know it's bad, but I got another thing going on. I know it's terrible, but I don't think we can really do anything about it. The system is too big, it costs too much money, I don't have enough time. The world is replete. There are more people like that than the other type. But the people that make the change, the people that make the difference are the folks that say, I know that it's bad. I know that it's, it's terrible. I don't even know how I'm going to fix it, but I'm going to apply myself with whatever skill that I have, whatever skill that I have, at whatever level of development, 
to do something. You can't fix everything, but you can fix something. You can't do everything, but you can do something. And the question is, what, when you think about it, ask your question, what am I doing? Today, what am I doing? And I'm glad that you guys are here. This is something that we're doing together. But as you move forward with your friends, ask them that question. Say, what are you doing? What are we doing? But demand an answer. Like, demand an answer and then come up with a concrete next step. And it, the next step could be, I'm going to go on the website and find out about this group that I can join. Or I am going to research a speaker to have him come and speak at Howard or her speak at Howard because this motivates us. Like those tiny steps are the ways that you stay motivated. And you get little victories, little things that happen, and you start believing, I can do this. You know, I can do this. I've been, I've been doing this for a while. I still struggle with that question. I'll be straight up with you. I struggle with the question, I have no idea how I'm going to do this or what I'm going to say. I feel like I'm making it up as I go along. But when you look around the people in this room, that the power and the connection and the good ideas come from the collaborative model, it will happen. If, you, if the people in this room put their mind to a problem, it would be fixed in 48, it would be fixed by, by dinner time. Probably longer than this, you know, shorter than the speech is going to go. But um, that's my suggestion, is short steps, ask yourself, what am I doing? Take the next step down. Thank you. Thank you. I have time for one more question, and that's you, my brother. All right. Hi, my name is Samir Islam, I'm with 3L. Hi, Thank you for coming. So my question is about applying international law to state courts. No. Oh, oh, sorry. I was, I was like, oh, this is a question not allowed. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, wait. He's asking me to state back court down. question. I don't know. <laughs> so there's there's been a recent poll for a lot of state legislatures to say no to international law, and through through le legislation through anti-Sharia legislation, anti-international legislation. So my question is, looking at these legislations, especially in Louisiana, which is a state that has passed a similar type of provision, how do you bridge that gap in, in trying to tell a state court to apply treaty law when the legislature has said, don't go there? Oh, uh, yeah. That is the question, Samir. You asked, you asked the, the key question. And that's the place where most people um, consider the human rights framework and then give up. Because it is very hard to see that in kind of a backwater, Bible thumping, anti Sharia loving place, how they could possibly think about um, international law. Um, and there are, a number, there are a number of ways to think about it. And I think my role and the role of my organization is. Um, is the legal vision, because at some level, right, going back to believing that justice is possible, you have to at some level articulate a path that people can choose to walk down or choose not to walk down. If you don't articulate the path, um, then there's no walking happening. So the path that we're articulating is the suggestion that um, the treaties that the U.S. has signed on to create obligations for the state with respect to the individual, those are obligations, they're not suggestions, they're not, you know, kind thoughts, obligations. Mm -hmm. Those obligations have consequences in the application of things that we do every day. Here is what's happening every day. Here's the application of the law. It violates the law. So now, state, what are you going to do about it? That's sort of the vision that we're articulating here today. That doesn't get you all the way there. And very often what happens is if you're clearing a brush, if you're going through a, a, a field and you clear a path, um, it takes you a long time and you can't necessarily see what's coming next. But for the people that come behind you, that their path is much clearer, they can get there a little bit quicker. And really the idea is to think through um, how would we, in very small steps, make international law applicable. One way to think about this is to not even focus on the judges. And, to, and what people are doing um, around the country is they're creating human rights narratives. And they're actually looking for human rights on the local level and city councils and things like that. Because the story, once you have the person that's telling the story of what's happening to them, you have to be very, very callous in order to turn away. That's why all of these legislatures, every time, and I, I don't want to make light of it, but every time some terrible thing happens to a child or some terrible things, they name the law after the kid because people are really motivated. And then half the time you have really bad laws that are kind of unconstitutional, but it motivates people. So part of it is to tell the human rights story, the human rights framing in the story of average everyday citizens. And I will say, the last thing I'll say is that on the Sharia piece, that is also very much like the right-wing, right-to-life equivalency. It's right-wing talking points that is um, so cynical and deeply stupid that it's hard 
to imagine that we spend a lot of time thinking about it, but at some level you have to because they're coming up with this wacky stuff. And the thing is that nobody ever mentions uh, international law in any state legislature, any place in the world, unless they're banning a law that actually doesn't exist in the United States like Sharia law. It's crazy. Now, why are they doing that? It is not about Sharia law. It's not about international law. It's about Muslim South Asians and Arabs that live in their communities that they are trying to push out. That is literally what that's all about. So we have to have some clarity with um, what their tactic and strategy is and what our, what our response is going to be. So our view is that we haven't responded to the anti-Sharia laws, um, and it doesn't necessarily present an, uh, an opportunity to have the grand discussion. But at the same, way, at the same time, that there are other ways of addressing these things in terms of just straight out, flat out, old fashioned racial and uh, ethnic and national discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a gift presentation. Ms. Danielle Brown, if you would come forward. Hi, Mr. Warren. Um, I just want to thank you on behalf of Dean Dark and the entire law school community. We really appreciated this lecture, answering our questions, providing this dialogue for us. And I'm handing you this gift, but it's from everybody. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.